I wish you a very warm welcome uh, to this seminar um, on uh, Brexit and international dispute resolution, um, co-hosted by Wilma Hale um, and Walter uh, Kluvers. My name is uh, Maxi Scher. I'm the general editor of the Kluver Journal of International Arbitration. Um, and I'm very pleased to see uh, so many of you here. Uh, tonight's event is indeed to launch um, our special uh, issue on Brexit, uh, uh, the special issue of the Journal of International um, Arbitration. Now, let's look at this in more detail. What happens with the parliament, with the, with the decision to actually leave the European Union? That decision would be a notification to uh, the, Euro the Council, the European Council, and then a two years time period starts running in which the UK can negotiate its deal. And if no deal is reached and that period is not prolong prolonged, then the treaties cease to be in force. What would be the effect on all of the various provisions, the rights granted under EU law currently in force in the UK? Well, if you look at directives, directives have been transposed into British law. So actually that's British law it would continue in force. Regulations are not transposed, they, they have direct effect, and technically it's the European Communities Act of 1972 that transposes them, that they would stop having effect, they would cease to be in force, and we can then argue whether this uh, means annulling the statute or not. Very likely though it's the council that determines in the end who will be leading the negotiations, in all trade negotiations, classically, it was the Commission that negotiated. Uh, it's unclear whether that will happen here. What is clear is without the Commission, nothing can really happen because the Commission is in charge of the European bureaucracy and uh, the seat of the knowledge that is needed for negotiations. Uh, then those negotiations at first slated to be two years. How probable is it that this will be prolonged? Prolonging the two years requires consensus. So any single state could block it in theory. In practice, I think, if states have the feeling that there will be an agreement in the end, so if there's clear negotiation lines and if it becomes a technical negotiation like many free, tra free trade agreement negotiations, I think it's very likely to assume that the, this will be prolonged. If, however, it continues to be an exchange of general principles in which no one has a clear line, I am not that certain that this uh, will be the case. A regulation like the recast regulation has its direct application in this jurisdiction by virtue of Article 288 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. So basically, if we do nothing, we will have this regulation completely expunged from our legal system, which is not um, a desirable thing. And just to emphasise why that's not desirable, I'm going to quickly consider the position in the next couple of minutes as to what our legal landscape might look like if we did absolutely nothing and just waited for this ticking time bomb uh, to actually uh, take place once Article 50 is triggered. But the curious fact that I just point out as we explore in the article is that these conventions actually have specific termination regimes that have not been invoked. So I think while there are very good arguments both ways, I think the better view, um, as we've come to conclude in the article, is that there's a real risk that the Brussels Convention and these um, bilateral um, recognition and enforcement conventions may in fact revive if we do nothing. The third possibility, of course, is that the common law comes back after a 30-year holiday to save the day. And now one hopes these questions of reversion and revival will be entirely academic because the commercial reality is if we are left in the position where nothing is done by the government for however long these negotiations take, um, commercial parties will be quite worried indeed. Um, and one hopes that the UK will enact a specific replacement regime. Maybe if I can also ask you a, a quick follow-up question. I think you've uh, made it very clear what your preferred option would be, um, uh, both of you, in terms of uh, going forward with the, with the Brussels uh, regime. Um, do you have any sense, and you also you know, mentioned the hurdles, um, agreement by um, the other member states, 
um, but also maybe within Whitehall um, and, and uh, within the uh, UK government. Do you have any sense at this stage whether your preferred option is going to, to win the day or is this too early to say? Um, I was very surprised, actually, because I assumed that the Brussels regulation would be on about page 333, item number 20,003, in stuff that they were going to negotiate. I, we're hearing that um, maybe because civil servants have historically rather liked the Brussels regulation because it, it raises interesting issues of law, that they are very interested in this and they understand the importance of it for us and, and for London as a it's large invisible earnings of dispute resolution. Of course, I think there, there will be an issue. I think that potentially there is an issue between... Um, at the moment, there's a massive fact-finding uh, mission going on, and they want to know what we, the users, would like. And I think that the, that the Whitehall will come out in favour of a Brussels-type um, situation if they can. My concern, as I say, is whether or not they're going to be able to sell this to the UK government. One point just caught my interest. You were describing that there might be a, a scenario in which a claimant here in a EU court, court action could obtain documents that under the EU, under EU law would be protected under the da uh, damages directive. Yeah. And it strikes me that this would actually be very, uh, not very conducive to the purpose of the, of the damages uh, directive, which I guess is to in yeah. motivate uh, wrongdoers to, to confess. And so, so my question is, how realistic do you think this is, for example, would a UK, a UK court at this point order the production of documents that are protected in other jurisdictions, say in a US uh, mm. cartel proceedings, etc.? Would, would it really ignore the limitations in, in foreign laws? Uh, well, it, well, it may do. Um, I, think it's, I think the first point is whether the, the UK wants to protect a public policy objective in, a, in a, another jurisdiction. Mm. It, it, it may well do. But the position that we have today under EU law is under the, the Flydera case, and that, is, that essentially requires the court to go through, uh, to go through um, all of the documents that are submitted as part of the leniency application and decide whether, whether disclosure of that particular document or, pre, or parts of a particular document, are, where the balance, the balance of convenience, the balance of public policy versus the rights of the claimant lie. And hear stories of Peter Roth st sort of late at night with a bottle of wine, that bit is alleged. Um, uh, going through hundreds and hundreds of documents, and, and that is the case today. And the, the, the damages, when the damages directive comes in, that, that won't be necessary and won't be possible. But it, but it's, if we're not bound by the damages directive, that that could well be the, the position, the position we have today under EU law, where where um, essentially the, there is a case by case basis and a document by document basis on disclosure. And, and uh, one final question: Which, do, in your view, are the jurisdictions that are best positioned to get a share of this uh, follow? on the actions case. Yeah, well, I, th I think that the two are, are Germany and the Netherlands. Uh, they, they seem to be the jurisdictions that already uh, a number of, of uh, number of competition cases, and particularly in the Netherlands, has a, a form of a form of collective proceedings there, which is, is proving quite attractive. The IP regime in in Europe, uh, which today I think still includes the UK, is pretty much harmonised. Um, and so that means that Brexit will have an impact on the different IP rights um, and it will have a different impact on different rights. Creating this unitary patent um, has been a politically very difficult, has been a very, very long negotiation process, but we had just arrived at the point where everybody was and is in the process of ratifying it and it was supposed to enter into force everybody was thinking March, May 2017. One of the parties that needs to ratify this is England because this um, UPC agreement has to be um, agreed, has, sorry, has to be ratified by the three countries that have most patent applications, that file most patent applications, and that is the UK, Germany and France. And this is a huge problem at the moment because it's fairly unlikely that the UK will actually ratify this at this moment. And that is not because there's legally anything wrong with this, with this agreement, but it is because this agreement provides, even, even, even though it's, it's not, not um, um, how can I say, well, this, this agreement provides that EU law remains supreme and that the European Court of Justice in Luxembourg will still have um, the <coughs> last say and a major role to play. 
in brief, there are at least some doubts as to whether uh, tribunals should accept jurisdiction over intra EU uh, uh, disputes. Uh, and in our article, uh, we claim that claims uh, that may be brought under the UK's intra EU BITs after the UK withdraws from the EU will likely not be subject to these challenges from an EU law perspective. And we argue that following a withdrawal of the UK from the EU, EU investment structured uh, through the UK will no longer have an intra EU character, and therefore investors may wish to reconsider structuring the investments maybe through a UK company. Where does this uh, leave the UK? I think it's difficult to say. Uh, uh, whereas uh, the EU faces increasingly difficulties to negotiate trade and investment treaties with third states, it may well be that the flexibility that the UK may have if and when it exits the European Union uh, will prove to be beneficial. Um, we have covered um, quite a bit uh, tonight in terms of you know, various angles from where to tackle this very difficult question on the consequences of Brexit on international dispute resolution. Um, I knew that the, the, the debate was going to be lively. I was not uh, disappointed. Um, I would suggest that we continue our discussions over a, a glass of champagne, um, but not before uh, very warmly thanking all of our speakers of tonight uh, in the usual way. Thank you very much.